Hi, welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath. I'm Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Today we're going to be talking about how to crack a weight loss stall from keto or carnivore, or any weight loss stall really. Our program that we've really worked on the last three or four months, and this video is, is, is kind of an overview of all of that. And it's about breaking any weight loss stall. And our program is called Advanced Precision Protein Sparing Modified Fast with a focus on omega balancing. And that's a big deal. Let's get started. Okay, so how we got here? We got here primarily me almost dying and my wife having a brain tumor. So we didn't come here like, oh, let's look for a weight loss program. That's not what we were focused on. We were focused on how can we, re how can we live another week, month, year, and is it possible to regain your health? Real basic questions. I was from the medical orientation, which I still am. And she was from another different, she was database and analyst, but together we had to put together a life that was satisfactory, it was effective, and it was healthy. So I'm not gonna go into our story, we have a whole video on that, and here's the link for that, but it's how we came from that about eight years ago. Call it 2013 was the not a good year for us. So a more important question is really, how did you get here? And now that I've talked to a number of you, I have kind of a general outlay, we're all different, but here we go. So this is the advanced version of our protein sparing modified fast, and they say we're focused on omega balancing. So most people came to us or come to this concept because they needed to lose significant weight, right? Of course. They did keto and they had good results but plateaued. That led them to carnivore but still plateaued and they've been hearing about protein sparing modified fast or PSMF. And, but they don't really understand what that's about. Why is it a fast and you're having protein? I don't get it, so on and so forth. Well, let's straighten that out and let's hit the big points. That's the focus of today. So the first thing to know, this isn't a gimmick. I see this as a lifestyle. I don't see this as a week. We, I know we're gonna talk about days on and days off, but we're also gonna talk about in the end, what are we actually doing? You know, we've carried this forward for months and months and months, years actually. And how can that possibly be? Aren't we supposed to be emaciated or something go wrong at this point? No, I'll show you how we do it. Okay, so this is the closest thing to what I consider the ancestral diet you'll ever get without having to be a hunter-gatherer unless you wanna be. And there are a number of people who are still hunter-gatherers to my envy. You know, they get the salmon and they can go out for the elk or the moose or the, or the deer and, that's, and their freezers are full of game meat. That's, that's impressive. But what we're gonna focus on is what we're doing as you transition into this approach, into this way of thinking. And it's not gonna be something that you have to box, it. you're not going to jail. You're not imprisoning yourself into what you can't have. I'm gonna bring you into a different selection of choices that I hope you find as satisfying as myself. This is precision sparing modified fast. Here's the steps to creating an effective weight loss plan. The core of our plan is you calculate the amount of protein you need per day, then you divide that into basically four sections, and then you have, you eat four times a day. You can eat most of your protein at one point, which is what we do. You'll see what we do. And we use whole food sources of protein primarily. So we stay out of trouble. There's no processed foods in our lives at all. And timing of days on and days off, what does that mean? That's pretty much the core of it. I'm gonna add a little bit later, but that's the core of it. Let's go through this. All right, so first, and then what we're gonna to add to this is we're gonna create a demand by some exercise that's going to create a demand for your muscle protein synthesis to build muscle. Because if you're over the age of 20, ideally over 40, it's getting younger, is that the issue of sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass in your whole body becomes a stronger and stronger issue you have to address as you get older. And so this is addressing that by creating a demand for muscle protein synthesis. You're having the protein, let's put it to work, make some muscle for you. Okay, and the last part is become a clean burning incinerator is what I call it. That's the focus on the omega factor. Omega balancing, omega-6, we'll get into that. Okay, what supplements would we ever do? 
I'll just tell you that now, we really don't do much in the way of supplements. We have some electrolytes, so what that means for me is some magnesium, and I'll mention that later, magnesium, uh, potassium, salt in our coffee every so often. That's it. Not a big deal. Um, some essential fatty acids, otherwise known as fish oil. And then genomic support. Here's where people are very different. And this is not just making it unnecessarily more complicated. This is looking for where do people need that extra support. And that's a big deal. I've been doing that for about 13 years, and it's just a reality now. Okay, four things you need to be able to calculate, to be able to measure. First thing is your ideal average body weight for your height and gender. So this is only a reference used to calculate your daily amount of protein. This is not what you should weigh. Many people weigh more than this number, many people weigh less. We use this to calculate how much protein you need per day. Second thing is the amount of protein you require per day, which is one gram of protein per pound of that ideal body weight, is required protein per day. But also, what is the minimum amount of protein you need anytime you eat, these four times per day, to stimulate muscle protein synthesis? To stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Okay, this is going to be covered in a lot of other videos we've done, and you'll see that, but I'm just going to hit the high points. For men and for women, chose 5'10", that's about my height. I'm a little higher, actually, a little taller. Um, and so what that says is, well, for this particular height for a guy, I should have 162 grams. I weigh 162 pounds. According to this, the ideal weight is 162 pounds, which means 162 grams per day of protein is my amount of daily amount of protein. Well, I don't weigh 162. I weigh less than that actually now. Um, and that's fine. People weigh even less than, less than that. Some people weigh two or three times more at my height. That really doesn't matter. I'm using your height and your gender and a little bit of your age to set what is your daily amount of protein needed. And for 90 9% of the people in the United States, we are actually eating too few proteins. So that's one of the reasons as we get older, we get weaker. We get sarcopenia. That's why we get all these other injuries because we don't have a muscle mass to support us. A little bit of a side, but not really. And for women, it's the same thing. Obviously, it's a different scale. Okay, so for a woman 5'4", the ideal body weight is 125. I really don't care if you weigh this or not. I'm not saying you should. I'm using this as a calculation number, as a reference. So that means 125 grams of protein per day. And a minimum per snack, if you will, of 22 grams of protein per day. For me, it's 30 grams. Pretty even number, huh? Okay, this, the third thing you need to calculate is, well, how much protein is in that thing you're going to eat? So some people go, here's a chicken breast, they put it on a scale, the chicken breast is five ounces, they think it's five ounces of protein. No, it's not. Your chicken breast is not all protein. It's water, it's fat, and it's other things, okay? Water and fat primarily, and protein. So don't make that mistake. I get that all the time. If people are in a group, I can't eat this much protein. They're thinking they need, a, they need to eat a lot of protein. Uh, they don't, really. So, but you need to have a food scale and you put it on it and I'm going to show you, you put, m measure it, you weigh it, and you can use something like chronometer, which is what we use, which really correlates on three and a half ounces of skinless grilled chicken, how much protein is there? That's what we use. It's no big secret. Okay, here's an example. So one ounce equals, we'll call it 28 ounce, uh, 28 grams of protein, right? There's your, there's your ratio. So for a three and a half ounce grilled skinless chicken breast, it is about 30 grams. So for me, the guy who's 5'10", three and a half ounces of grilled skinless chicken breast is exactly what I need as a minimum, right? So when I eat, why not have the minimum amount of protein to stimulate the maximum amount of protein muscle synthesis? If I had this four times a day, you go, well, three times four, um, I'm only getting 120 grams of protein, and I'm supposed to have 162. Obviously, my dinner is a little more. And you can even eat five times if that's what you want. So as a rule of thumb is what I do to make this even simpler, is to take what you need per day, divide it by five, what is 20%, and then if you want to spread that over five times, great. 
few people eat five times a day. And I'll show you exactly what we do. I think if you shoot for four, one being a dinner, uh, one being morning, late morning, early afternoon, dinner, that's it. Anyways, here's other examples. Four ounces of roast skinless turkey breast. Um, turkey, by the way, is a lot leaner than chicken breast. Grilled salmon, a sirloin, salmon, cooked shrimp. So it's out there, very easy. This is, if you did nothing but this, you're all set. And so what about the woman who needed 22? Well, she's not going to eat the whole chicken breast if she wants to be that specific about it. Okay, fourth thing is, what we used to do, we used to bring the concept of intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating, which is the same thing, to our protein-sparing modified fast. So we would have uh, kind of a breakfast, lunch, and nothing till six. You know, that's not necessary to do. The whole thing for intermittent fasting was to, they call it autophagy, fancy word of, of, of uh, taking out all the broken pieces of your mitochondria and so on. Um, but basically it's for carb eating people. If you take a break from eating carbs, your pancreas gets to relax. Your glucose doesn't go up. Your insulin doesn't have to go up. But when we're eating protein only, whole food sources of protein, so that's protein and fat, that doesn't happen. So it's not necessary to do that. So here's what we do now. We have our morning snack, if you will, after we get back from working out, late morning, 11.30, early afternoon, and then we have dinner. Pretty straightforward. I go at length about talking about the difference between intermittent fasting and protein sparing modified fast in this video. There's a link, and then you can find that in our videos. But to make a long story short, here's what normal people eat. It used to be called the diabetic diet. And then of course, over here, this is intermittent fasting. You're not eating that many times. You've eliminated some of those snacks or some of those meals, maybe just twice a day. All right, well, that makes sense because look what happens. Your glucose doesn't rise and fall. Your insulin doesn't have to rise and fall. And so therefore, it's a lot easier and a lot healthier way of living. All that is true. So then how could you possibly do protein sparing modified fast and eat roughly four times? Well, when you're not eating, you're actually fasting. And the fast is primarily a carbohydrate fast. There's no carbs you're having in it. So when you do a carbohydrate fast, that is where the autophagy really gets started. Here's a uh, graph of the difference of what rises your glucose. Obviously, the carbohydrates do. When people say, oh, protein, it spikes your, your, spikes your glucose and will spike your insulin, that's not true. When you just have protein, whole food sources of protein, it hardly increases your glucose at all. It rises and then it just falls quickly. If you're having a lot of carbohydrates, which you wouldn't be doing on this particular uh, regime, is that, and you add protein to that, you bet it will spike your protein if you add carbohydrates and proteins together. But proteins, whole food sources of proteins by themselves do not. Okay, divide your protein into four eating times, I call them. The big picture is take your total amount of protein, example, 120 grams per day. We divide that by five, which is 20%, so that's 24 grams. So that's the amount of chicken breast or tuna or, or sardines or mackerel that she has to have. So how is she going to find that out? Well, she's going to go look on chronometer how much, you know, how much sardine she has to eat for 24 grams of protein. I'll show you a comparison coming up. Um, but you'll notice if you only had this four times a day, you would be under your total requirement, right? So four times 20, you're, you're missing 20%. Where's that fifth? We add it to our dinner, so our dinner is two of those times, if you will. Okay, so here we're talking about the minimal amount you need as a guy over here and as a woman over here. These are the different heights. Here's me down here. So my minimal amount of protein that I need per snack is 30 grams. That's gonna stimulate, give me the maximum stimulus for muscle. Just eating enough protein gives me muscle protein synthesis. That's a big deal. Most people don't consider that. They go, oh, that's too much protein. When somebody says that to you, go over and feel their bicep. They probably don't have one. They're probably what they call tofi. They're thin on the they're thin on the outside and fat on the inside, meaning they're under muscled. So this is what we're ta talking about in our have at least this much to give you maximum stimulus. So if somebody said, "Well, I'll eat two chicken breasts," that's a waste. You just need to 
you know, break the threshold to stimulate the mus muscle protein synthesis. Here's an example of that, and here's where I get this research. I didn't make it up. This is out of phys physiologists in the UK and Canada and some in the United States. So here's basically older people, you might say like myself, that their muscle breakdown is greater than their muscle buildup. So they gradually are atrophying, their muscles are atrophying faster and faster and faster. So what can they do about it? Well, first, they can have enough protein. And as you get older, you need actually a little more protein. Not much more, but you need more protein. But at least have this amount of protein per what we've just outlined. And you'll see you'll change it from here to that. So now our synthesis, our muscle synthesis has increased. All right, that's a big deal. So when you have this three, and we're gonna say, show you other graphs, three to four to five times a day, you don't really need to eat five times a day ever, unless you're a bodybuilder and you're an Olympic athlete and you're really trying to push it for a maximum amount of pro muscle protein synthesis, fine. For you and me, three and four times is adequate. So just having the correct amount of protein makes a huge difference in the rate of your muscle protein synthesis. This is a list of all the videos that I've done about the muscle, about protein sparing muscle fat, muscle fat fat, protein sparing modified fast and how to get the best results. Uh, also on sarcopenia, it's a big deal. So where you wanna learn more about it, we've covered a lot of the issues. Here's the link for that. And you can go into some of the bigger, I'm just hitting the high points today. Okay, so want to use whole food sources of protein, meat, beef, lamb, game, pork. You'll find game is very lean, fish, sardines, mackerel, salmon, cod, haddock. That's generally what I use. People say, why not tuna? If you want to use tuna, use tuna. Just know that tuna, swordfish, uh, for the most part, are higher in mercury. And that actually is a true fact. I would spend a good part of a decade and a half uh, chelating mercury out of people that would make a difference. They were primarily tuna eaters. They loved their tuna and loved their swordfish. It was very easy. So I became a believer that that actually is true. And there's plenty of research that you can look into. Poultry, turkey, chicken, and know that turkey is a lot leaner than chicken. Turkey is half the fat of chicken. So whole food sources of, of protein are this, fish, meat, poultry. So we're talking whole food here and we're setting you up for a month. If you focus on this, you notice it's all the processed foods gone. Now we're just focusing on this. So we'll need to be, think about what things to make, how to make it so we really love to have it, how to make it so it's convenient. So timing, days on and days off. Here are the questions that come up. Do you do continuous days on or alternative days on and off? Like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday for on days or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for off days. What Judy and I do primarily are four or five days on We've been doing this so long that I would say I, I do it forever. I just make sure at times to have uh, liver and egg yolks intermittent once a week sometime. And that's all I need to have complete nutrition. If you are just focusing on lean sources of protein forever, you are gonna deny yourself some of the important fat-soluble vitamins. And so liver, by the way, is, is an on and off meat to have. It's not excessively fatty and it's very nutritious. So if you had liver in your on days and your off days, uh, you probably wouldn't need to even have egg yolk. I do both. It's kind of a belt and suspenders approach. They're both highly nutritious foods. And um, that's kind of what I consider the secret to the on days and off days, but you could do it combined. So now I want to talk about creating a demand for muscle protein synthesis. What is this? Well, it's going to the gym for us. You could do it in your house if you want to with body weight exercises. But what we do is high intensity training. We do each other. So we do it. So we actually have an iPhone here and we measure it for 10 seconds, 10 seconds out, 10 seconds back. That's slow, by the way. That's very slow. And we do the same exercises. This is me wearing a CGM. And you can see the results of this showing that I spiked my glucose because that's what you should do. When you're going that slow and that strong with uh, high intensity training, you are creating a cortisol moment. You are kind of living in fear. It's the saber tooth tiger that's after you. It's the bear that's after you in the woods. It's that kind of adrenaline rush that you have created by doing this. And this is the mark that I've hit my adrenaline rush. This is the peak. And once I hit this peak, this is gonna set me into 48 hours of muscle protein synthesis. So it's a neat trick. It's hard, it's, it's really hard. So for both of us to sit there with the timer and count, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 
and they go five, 10. So a person can know when they're halfway, out all the way, halfway, back all the way, halfway. Um, we've been doing this for now for a couple of years and it's made a big difference. Okay, so this is what those, those graphs look like when you add working out. Look at how it really ex expanded, it really increased the muscle protein synthesis in both of these. So this is just exercising. And this is down here exercising and eating four times a day. You see now you've really maximized out for the day your muscle protein synthesis. And if you were an Olympic athlete, a bodybuilder, you would probably try to fit in a fifth. Remember, you're doing those minimal amount of proteins to get the maximum stimulus for MPS, muscle protein synthesis. Boom, boom, boom. That's the secret. This is based on a lot of physiology. So merely by working out, you have increased your demand. So any kind of working out, if you're gonna walk around the block and you weren't doing it before, that's a tremendous increase. And um, by, by creating this demand, you minimize now the muscle breakdown. So you, now you've maximized muscle protein synthesis, minimize the breakdown. By adding a fourth eating time, a snack or a meal, you have increased the frequency throughout the day. Pretty cool, eh? So as we get older, it's just the way it is. We need more protein. Not a lot more protein, but this is on a per kilogram basis. I'm not gonna get into the details, but I do. In this particular video, I go deep into these particular details. As you get older, you need more, but for most people that's irrelevant because they're so under eating the amount of protein that they need that you know it's just get them up to the ideal body weight. One gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight is going to be very helpful. And then you can start measuring it out. Okay, how to become a clean burning incinerator is what I say. It's the omega factor. What we have to do is we have to assess and reduce the amount of omega-6 we have in our bodies. We are all too high. Um, as I'll show you in a second, somewhere in the 18, 19s, even 20s, that's a, that's a ratio between omega-6 and omega-3. We have to reduce the amount of omega-6. And so that's what a protein sparing modified fast does, in essence, it burns it off. Since we're not bringing in new sources of omega-6, a little bit through some of the foods, the meats we have, it is in the meats, and the chickens and the pork primarily, that we now, ex we now burn off all the extra. And that's a really good place because your omega-6, your linolenic acid, which is what is added to all these vegetable and seed oils and so on, really keeps you from burning fat. Absolutely, it's a hibernating oil. So I call it the obesity oil. But here's another analogy. It's really like driving with your handbrake and footbrake on. It's just fighting against you. When you burn that off, and we only need a little bit, so you get down to a one-to-one -one ratio. You don't get down to zero, one-to-one -one ratio. Then you suddenly have become an incinerator. You have only are holding the amount of fat that your body requires. You're not, ha you're not hanging with fat, like most Americans are now, or trees to hang fat on, more or less. Okay, so you get tested. Here's what the Omega panel looks like. And I would make a little spreadsheet just like this. In three months, do it again. Another three months, do it again. Um, and if you're headed in the right direction, maybe six months later, and then another six months, and then once a year, you do this. So once you learn what your sources are, but first you have to know, where are you on this? What are your levels? Arachidonic acid is a big deal. Um, what we use and, and support is uh, Ulta Labs, which is a Quest, use Quest Labs. What I like about LabCorp, which is not this, it actually has a linoleic acid um, added to this. So it's one more panel, but it's a minor point. It's just a nifty test to add to this panel. I hope that Quest does it eventually. So there you go. So you need to know your 6 3 ratio. And we're going to reduce the 6. We're not going to be adding omega 3. We're going to be reducing the 6 first, and down the road, maybe we'll add some 3. Here's just a page from all the people that I work with to show you, and this, this green row here is their omega-6-3 ratio. And look at, that's roughly 18, 18 to one. You go down, here's another 18 to one, 14 to one. But why I pick these people out is look at all the red. Look how inflamed they are. They're, you know, HSCRP, which is your inflammatory marker, is considerably higher than those that are not and so all of these things are in excess. So it goes along with that picture. So if you can move and drop down your omega-6, that is a big deal. And it will change a lot of this. So just focusing on that through PSMF 
will be a dramatic difference. You're on, you're releasing your handbrake, you're releasing your foot brake, and now you can finally really start to burn some fat. Okay, the other thing is, for a month, I would say don't do nuts. I know nuts are good for all these different reasons. One is they have a lot of carbs. But just don't do nuts, don't do nut butters, and for sure, never do seed oils, right? That's the soy, the corn, the safflower, the canola. Just don't do that. So for a month, set yourself up to win. Don't do these things. Focus on the whole food sources of protein, how to cook it, how to enjoy it, how to make it so it's there when you want it. All right, again, how to become an incinerator continued is that I would, I talked about chicken and pork before, this is the standard grocery store brands. So this isn't going to the farm that has free range chicken that just eats bugs and so on. That probably is not a concern at all. That's not gonna be very high in um, omega-6. And same with the pork. If the pork was um, farms that didn't feed soy and corn to pigs solely, um, probably other slop or whatever they feed the pigs, acorns or something, there's more corns, there's more uh, seeds, that they would be a lot less omega-6 than they are the way they're re raised now in the cages and in the um, standard way. North Carolina is big for both of these, by the way. Okay, so here we're looking at the actual food. I got this from Chronometer. I put a, a chart together of fish. Fish generally is, has no omega-3, uh, no omega-6. Yeah, you can say, no, I see it's there. Well, hardly any relative to meat and poultry. So all fish is good. I would say focus on your sardines, your mackerel, um, salmon, herring, tuna if you want to. I threw that in because a lot of people have tuna. There's no omega-6 there. Um, but it's the mercury thing. Meat, your highest meat source will be pork. And if it's farm raised, it's a lot less. Same with the chicken down here. The chicken is really gonna be your highest source of omega-6, depending how it was raised. So just be, for a month or so, why don't you go light on the pork and chicken? And um, for the chicken eaters, go to turkey. Turkey is far less. Look, it's half the amount, half the amount of omega-6, also half the amount of fat. And all these numbers are how much of this thing would I have to eat to have 160 grams of protein, which is me. How much of chicken breast would I have to eat in a day to get 160 grams? And I would, I would need 19 ounces. So on that, normalizing for a protein amount per day, you see the differences. And then there's, there's cheddar there's cheese. Anyways, tempted with cheese. Cheese is always very high. Dairy is very high in omega-6. Certainly process, all processed foods are even higher. Okay, so I go into the omega, what I call the omega-6 catastrophe in a number of videos. You can see a lot of details about that. Some people are tired of hearing it, I'm sure, but you need to know why this is so important and you need to know how to address it, identify it, and then choose to reduce it. And it's not a big hardship. Primarily, it's gonna be giving up a lot of your processed foods, but once you know what those sources are, it's easier to push that aside. Believe me, you'll like your new self. Okay, so NPR has covered this in a number of issues about processed foods. You know, it's not just the salt, sugar, and fat. Study finds ultra processed foods drive weight gain. And why does it drive weight gain? Because of the omega-6, the linoleic acid that they add. Okay, again, there's a book out there, Hooked, you know, how food has been engineered to be addictive. And the biggest part of that is the omega-6. Yes, they have various chemicals and preservatives, additives, you got it but it's the omega-6 that is making you gain the weight. Certainly the calories, but you can't lose it as easily. These are hibernating oils to keep you from losing it. So what we have on our on days, our on protein sparing modified fast days, is pretty much everything that I've showed you. But when people ask a lot of questions, I brought you to our refrigerator, I brought you to what we eat very literally, on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as some um, support for why we chose what we chose. So you can get to that on this particular video. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the, the trick to all of this, to life in general, if you ask me, is to make it fun and delicious. And so we do that. So here is a long list of things that we make, we being Judy primarily, right? And I would say what has really become special in our lives is the protein sparing modified fast bread that she makes. And she makes a lot of different variations of this, of course, both seasonally and whatever. And it's really become such a nice after dinner treat. We sit down, watch a Netflix movie or something, 
or not or read a book. Uh, but it's nice to have the tea and crumpets, as she says. It's a big deal. But there's a lot of big deals in here. So here's a long list. It's a playlist of how to make what we love to eat on our protein sparing modified fast. And there's a link to that. Okay, so what do we have on our non sparing protein sparing modified uh, on our non PSMF days? And another video is on that. I bring you to our kitchen, I break it out to show you exactly what that was, take you a tour into the garage to our CR freezer. So you get to see in complete transparency what it is we do, what we make for ourselves, how we eat. So the big question is, for your non-protein sparing modified fast days to include carbs or not. Some people say, well, I just go back to my keto. You know, I'm keto for the 20 grams of carbs per day. We used to do that a couple of years ago, but I have no use for carbs at all, except for herbs and the sauces that Judy makes, like the jalapeno jelly or the pesto or the whatever. And so for me, we don't, but most people do return to kind of a normal keto for their days off. So PSMF, four or five days a week, keto one or two days a week. So what we do, we no longer have carbs in our days off. We have our egg yolk waffles and sauces and there are some carbs in them, especially the jalapeno jelly. Frequently asked questions and comments. How do I consume this much protein? Well, you measure it out and you find out that it's really not that much to consume. Um, and that's the first thing. If you measure it out and see what you have to eat. But people who ask this question, I can't eat this much protein, what they're saying is this. I wanna eat the carbs that I'm eating, but I'll have more protein and will that help me? Well, if you have the carbs you're eating and you're adding the protein, that will spike your insulin. That will give you um, uh, a problem. And so protein sparing modified fast is whole food sources of protein only. Lean whole food sources of protein only. So it's a giveaway when people ask this question, but it's never, it's never bothered anybody who actually has just jumped in and you know, followed what we do. I don't weigh the ideal weight you refer to. Is this a problem? No, it has nothing about your weight. In fact, I don't care what you weigh. I care what your height and your gender is, and I'll get a ballpark reasonable expectation. It's not rocket science. I'm not locking you in, but I'm giving a place for us to build because most people are way under in terms of the amount of protein they eat on a daily basis, and that's a danger. Okay, what if I never did keto or carnivore and I'm starting this? Well, I would start it more slowly. I'd be much more conscientious about starting this. People who are keto and or have been doing carnivore for six months or a year or so, it's a pretty easy transition into this. They just, they just focus on lean sources of protein. But for those who don't, start, you know, really pay attention to what you have to do. If, you're gonna, if you think you're going to maintain your carbs while you're doing this, that's a big mistake. So please don't do that. I notice my ketones decrease and my glucose increases. Um, that's true. Your first month, pretty much your first month, you'll see that change. If you have uh, ketones three and four, they're going to drop down to one or so, but then they will kind of climb back up to a degree. You don't need to have ketones that high. Looking for one or two range, that's fine. And that's what's going to happen long term because your body is going to be much more precise, hence precision, protein sparing modified fat fasting, it will be much more precise in terms of how much ketones it makes and also its efficiency to use your ketones. All right, I do you do continuous days on or al alternating days on and off? That's a choice you can make. We do it a block of time and then kind of the weekend off. On the weekend, we have the, the uh, egg yolks we have in various forms, mostly the waffles. We have some wine. Um, that's a fun thing to look forward to in the weekends. Okay, so what we've put our notes together and are basically putting this to what we call precision, advanced precision protein sparing modified fast. And we'll be putting this together as a PDF and upgrading our program shortly. Till next time, I hope that was helpful.